Welcome to Grace Church STL Online. We are so excited that you've joined us. We believe that you are here with a purpose, that God sent you here. And so we're so excited. So we pray that you enjoy your time, that you're blessed by the message. And hey, we ask you to pay it forward. Share this with your friends. Leave a comment. We can't wait to connect with you. Let's worship.
cross be lifted I the great exchange of love and grace came down to give us life
Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Lord, it's our joy to honor you. Lord, it's our joy to bless you and to serve you and to love you. In Jesus' name, amen. What a song, incredible song. Good morning, everybody. Hey, turn around and wave to somebody, if you will, this morning. Congratulate them for not freezing solid on the way in. Glad that you're here. Go ahead and grab a seat. Pull out your bulletins, if you will. Those of you joining online as well, we're glad that you're tracking with us. You're always welcome to watch us online or come here in person. Just a few announcements, if you will. Number one, our young adults, we have a, a quick connect right after the service this morning in the upper atrium. We'd love for you to hang out for just a little bit. You know, college students, young professionals, 20s, 30s, come meet some other young people here at Grace, grab a bite to eat. Just a chance to kind of see what all's going on in our, we call our young adult ministry, Saint City, and see what's going on in that world, meet some new friends. Love for you to do that. Also, our students this morning over here somewhere, there's our students. Just as a reminder, our students now, every Sunday, just before the 11 a.m., we have food, snacks, and stuff, about 10.30, 10.45 coming down, sitting in church together. Students, but come be a part of that. It's a great way to get connected. Hey, just so you know, in our offering, you know, we don't pass buckets anymore. You know, we're giving online. There's ways to give electronically. If you have something physically you want to give, you can do that on, on your way out at any of the receptacles at the, any of the exits. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just super proud to be a part of a spiritual family that has continued to give generously, even in hard times. We're making an impact as a church family here locally. We're also making an impact uh, across the world. Check out the screens here and let's look at this testimony real quick. Hi, Grace Church. I'm excited to have this opportunity to share what you have been involved in the last 32 years to help us, to support us, to network with us, uh, to and reach into the lives of very, very, very poor families in Reynosa, Mexico. Over those years, we've built over 2,000 homes. Grace Church has built a lot of them. And recently, I say recently, the last 10 years, a program called Escuela Viva has reached into uh, this poor area and helped children go to school. Most of these kids would never go past sixth grade. This year, we have 97 students in high school. Last year, we graduated 27 students, and we have 20 students going to college. And it's all because of the efforts of what Grace Church St. Louis has done. Thank you so much. Man, I tell you, there is something so powerful in the church family honors the Lord with our giving and watch the name of Jesus grow in fame. You know, we do a trip down to Mexico every year, usually around Christmas time. Be looking for that. It's a life-changing experience to go down and to help those in need and to serve. And of course, we have so many opportunities right here, locally, in the city, throughout the metro area, where we're making an impact in real people's lives. And again, I'm proud to be part of a spiritual family that does that so well. So God bless you for God's grace at work in us. Well, lastly here, right here on top of your bulletin, our Discover Grace classes. Now this class is happening right now. We do these uh, for the last several Sundays. We're doing them on Sundays. It's four classes. We use these classes for those interested in learning more about membership, but it's, it's much more than that because membership isn't, you, you don't have to. You could use the classes to do this. Number one, to learn who we are as a church. Number two is to learn who you are. God's unique gifting and purpose, the way he's crafted and made you to be uh, a person of great impact for his kingdom. Actually in 102, the class today, that's the class that we're doing that today is helping us discover the way that the Lord has made us. In March, we're actually shifting those classes to Wednesday. If those interest you, I want to encourage you to take us up on that and check out that class. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you in, in the name of Jesus. Lord, for your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for the the grace of God that is at work in us to continue to give extravagantly and serve with our time and, and bless others with our words. Jesus, we thank you for the freedom to come together, to assemble, to worship, and to hear your, hear your word, to be strengthened and convicted by your word. And we love you in Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, everybody, I need a big, warm welcome to our dear friend Stuart Grease from Kansas City. Come on now, just a little bit more. Stuart has been a faithful voice in the church here at Grace Church many years coming in, and I worked with Stuart for over a decade in Kansas City, and just such a strength, his friendship, his, his insight into the Word, his teaching gift. So, brother, we're glad that you're here again. Let's pray. Father, we ask this morning that you would anoint the scriptures, open our hearts and our ears, our minds to understand you and to see the truth of scripture. Lord, bless our brother and his family. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in his life. We receive him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wes. Well, good morning. It's uh, so uh, good to be with you all. I know I say this every time, but uh, I mean it every time. And uh, I always look forward to, uh, to being here, just uh, the sense of the Lord's presence uh, during the time of worship and so forth. I also just want to uh, give my greetings uh, on behalf of Mike Bickle. He wants to make sure that I said hello to all you guys. And uh, he just has so much love and affection for uh, this spiritual family, for Pastor Ron and Pastor Debbie and Pat and Wes and the whole team here. And so I just send uh, his uh, warm greetings on a chilly day. <laughs> Man, it's cold out there. Jeez. Anyway. All right, turn your boss with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's going to share some uh, preliminary thoughts out of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but we're going to spend uh, most of our time on uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to talk this morning about uh, living a life that matters, living a life that matters. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for Grace Church. Father, thank you for this spiritual family. Uh, Father, thank you for the work, Lord, that you have started and the work that you will bring into fullness. Father, we thank you for your presence. Father, we thank you for your son. Father, we ask you that this morning by your spirit, Lord, that your son, the morning star, would rise on our hearts. Lord, that you would illumine our understanding. You would illumine our thinking by the power of your word. Father, we ask you that your spirit would magnify your son this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So when I look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul the Apostle makes a very, uh, very powerful statement. It's a, it's a critical statement. It, it's, it's essential uh, for us as believers to, to grow in our understanding of what it is that Paul is uh, uh, communicating here uh, to the church of Corinth. The 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 he says, for we, talking about us as believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, every single believer has this divine appointment. We have a court appointment uh, that we will enter into at a time of our death or at the time of the Lord's coming. And Paul says, this must happen. This is an absolute certainty. We may not know what tomorrow holds. We may not know what next week holds. But what we do know for sure in the future, we have an appointment with Christ Jesus the judge. And at this judgment seat, Paul tells us that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, what is this judgment seat? It is a lot to be said about a judgment seat. It's, it's a vast subject. But I just want to give some aspects to it for us this morning that we can kind of begin to wrapping our hearts and our minds around it and ask the Lord to give us insight in terms of how to grow in our understanding and how it relates to the way that we live today. The judgment seat is a place of evaluation. 1 Corinthians 5.10, it's where we receive 
according to the things that we've done in the body, the things we've done in this life, whether good or bad. It's a place of evaluation for believers. When we're talking about a judgment seat of Christ, we're talking about a place where believers get evaluated. Young believers get evaluated at a different reality of the throne of God. It's found in Revelation chapter 20. It's called the great white throne of judgment. But this judgment seat is a place of evaluations where we get evaluated in terms of how we lived our lives under the grace of God. Secondly, it is a place where we get rewarded. So we get evaluated and then we get rewarded according to the way that we lived our lives. A couple more thoughts that kind of introduce this topic is that the judgment seat of Christ and the throne of grace, they are the same place, the same reality. And the reason why I think it's important to understand that is because the evaluation that we will undergo as believer, we must understand is that it will be done in accordance to his character. It will be done in accordance to his holiness, it will be done in accordance to his righteousness. It will be done in accordance to his justice. But it will also be done in accordance to his mercy. It will be done in accordance to his grace. The, uh, the, uh, God's editing processes and grace is part of how it is that he is going to evaluate us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the apostle says that we will be, um, that all the things, even the hidden things in darkness will be, re will be revealed. They will be put on full display. And then he says, and then each one will receive praise from God. And so it is a place of evaluation as well as a place of affirmation. And so you can, and we can end up getting affirmed in terms of, not affirmed in terms of our value, but affirmed in terms of him going, man, I really esteemed the way that you lived your life in my, uh, under my grace. However, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, it says that it could also be a place of loss, where we will suffer, where many will suffer loss. But, the, but it's not a place of salvation, it's a place of evaluation, because he says, and we'll look at that in just a few moments, that, that even though there is loss, they will be saved as though by fire. And what is this loss? It's, it's a loss of reward. It's, it's a loss of, I believe, a function in the age to come because we are a part of the reward is that we will have a, a particular assigned authority to rule and reign with Christ uh, in the age to come. Every believer will rule and reign with Christ in the age to come, but not every believer will rule with Christ in the same way because it will be done according to the authority apportioned to them based upon the faithfulness in the gospel and the way that they lived in this life. Second Corinthians, sorry, Second John, verse 8, tells us that is, there is the receiving of the full reward. And so, though there's some that are going to receive some of the reward, there's some that will lose uh, a, a reward, but there's also this thing where we can live our life in such a way that we can receive the full reward that God has destined for us. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 24, there's a very, very important principle that we see there. It's the parable of the talents, where we've got, um, you know, the one guy had 10 talents, the other guy had five, and then and there was one who had one talent. And we see in the passage that the one with five talents and the one with 10 talents, that they in faithfully invested their talent. And when the master returned, that talent had yielded dividends, and it brought great pleasure and delight to the master for the way that these people faithfully stewarded and managed the talents that God had given them. But there was this one guy who had one talent, and instead of investing the talent, he buries the talent, and when the master returns, the talent, does not, uh, he, has no, he has nothing to show for. There, there, uh, there's no dividends that he has to, uh, uh, to show of his investment because he did not invest his talent. Now, what is important to note in that story is why it is that he did not invest his talent. That's really, really important. And the reason why he did not invest his talent, he says that he thought that the master was harsh. 
He perceived the master as harsh, and because he thought the master as harsh, it did not give him the courage to take, and it did not give him the confidence and the courage to take the risk to invest that one talent. And the reason why that's important is because the thing that is absolutely essential for us to continue to grow in how to say yes to the Lord more fully in terms of our obedience and faithfulness in our lives before him is actually growing in our understanding of how tender and how merciful and how loving and how deeply committed he is towards us. And so growing in the revelation of God's love is absolutely essential. You know, I think of the Apostle Paul when he says in Romans chapter 12, he says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. He goes, in light of the discovering of how kind, how extravagantly kind God is. How many of you know that God is absolutely the kindest person person you will ever, ever, ever meet. He is the most kind person ever. And as we grow in that kindness, the only reasonable thing then to say, well, if you're, if you're that kind, man, I'm yours. And that's what's so important as we're talking about the subject of the eternal rewards is the understanding that he is indescribably kind. When we think of him as a harsh taskmaster, that's the thing that locks us up, it shuts down our spirit, and we don't yield ourselves to him in the way that is worthy of him. Second Corinthians, uh, excuse me, First Corinthians chapter three. First Corinthians chapter three, and we'll, we'll, stay, we'll stay there for the rest of our time together this morning. First Corinthians chapter three. By the way, to kind of get a sense of what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I want to encourage you to actually look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, that those four chapters together really um, just give us a broader picture of what it is that's in Paul's heart as he is calling the church of Corinth to, to wholeheartedness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1, the three, what we see here is Paul is highlighting the, uh, the personal life, our personal individual lives that Jesus values. Again, it's not that we as individuals become more valuable. No, we were so valuable to him that he died on the cross. We're not talking about our value. We're talking about living a life that he says, you know what? He goes, I really, really, really love the way that, way, the way that person is living. It brings great pleasure to me. And that's a life that I will reward when it's done before me. First Corinthians chapter three, verses one to three, shows us this life, the importance of, of, the, of the individual life. And Paul says this, he goes, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people. But ra instead of spiritual, you can say people who are eternally minded. Because I cannot speak to you as people who are eternally minded. I can only speak to you, he says, as to carnal and spiritual babes. In other words, he goes, I can only talk to you. I can only, because later on in chapter, verse 2, he talks about, I can only give you milk. And the reason is, is because you're, he says, you're still too locked in with what is happening in this life? Your, your hope is too connected with what this life has to offer. He goes, and this connection or this temporal thinking, that's another way to say it, this temporal thinking is part of what is contributing to your spiritual immaturity. That's what he means by being babes in Christ. So he says in verse two, so because of this, he goes, I can only give you milk. You are not able to receive solid food. And what is meant by solid food is I'm not, you're not able to receive uh, all, the, the, um, all the riches, all the implications. That's the word. You're not able to receive all the, 
wonderful implications that the gospel has to offer. You, 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 you can't connect with it. Uh, you, you, you can't connect with the, uh, the full realm of what God has in store uh, for us insofar as the age to come. He says, I can only give you milk. Verse three, because, he says, you're still carnal. Instead of saying carnal, he goes, because you're still earthly minded, you're still temporal in your thinking. Your hope is still connected to what is happening in this life. And then he goes on to say in verse three, he begins to give us some of the implications, some of the manifestations, some of the signs of what a temporal, uh, what temporal Christianity looks like. He says, there is strife, envy, and divisions among you. He goes, are you then not just temporal in your thinking, behaving like mere men? Envy, strife, division, and that has so many, 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 many layers. Isn't it interesting that he says envy, strife, and division, when we think about carnal, you'd think he'd say, you know, drunkenness and immorality and all those different things. And yes, drunkenness and immorality is part of carnal behavior, but I find it interesting that he highlights these three things as the manifestation of what it means to be a carnal Christian. To be filled with jealousies. And, and you know, jealousy, you know, jealousy is one of those sins that nobody has. Okay, so <laughs> y'all completely missed that one. <laughs> no, it's the one that nobody has, that, that green monster nobody has. And we know it's real, but it's kind of like in theory. <laughs> and it may be the person in front of us has it towards us, but, but we never have it. <laughs> I mean, when's the last time you had someone confess envy to you, like for real? But envy and strife and division, they are all rooted, what it's actually anchored in, it is anchored in a longing for an inheritance and not being connected with the fact that God has an eternal inheritance available to us. And so what ends up happening, we end up fighting for the crumbs in this life. And we push and scratch and argue and debate and all these different things because we think that the crumbs are inheritance and, and Paul goes, no. He goes, you're temporal minded. He goes, if you were to catch a glimpse of what it is that God has available for us, it would change the way you think. In fact, Jesus on 16 occasions, eight times in the gospel, eight times in the book of Revelation, he makes this very powerful statement. He says, he that has an ear, let him hear. In Revelation, he adds what the spirit is saying to the churches. Now, what you'll find when we look at that phrase, I encourage you to look at it, most of the time, there's maybe an exception or two, but most of the time when he says, he that has an ear, let him hear. In other words, if you have an ear, he goes, you need to incline and really pay attention. That's what he's saying. He's about to say something about eternity and about the age to come. That we, was, we want to lean into this. We want to ask the Holy Spirit, in fact, I believe that one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit, if you're born again this morning, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you because of the born again experience, one of the number one things the Spirit wants to do, he wants to give us assurances of the eternal promises that God has in store for us in the age to come. Secondly, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses uh, 4 to 9, what we see there is the ministry that God values, the work that God values, or the kind of impact that God desires us to have that he values. Now, when we're talking about ministry, uh, we're not talking about a ministry platform. We're not talking about a social media falling per se. We're talking about the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which every believer has, and we utilize those gifts to impact people's lives in love and in humility. As I mentioned earlier, this issue of the judgment seat is not an issue of 
salvation, but rather it is an issue of evaluation, right? First Corinthians chapter three, verse 15, he talks about suffering loss, but saved as though by fire. Now, in the first three verses of the issue of being carnal and being temporal-minded, I think this is really critical for the times in which we're living because what Paul is doing is he is confronting so much of what is being talked about, promoted, and proclaimed through uh, a good portion of the church. And I don't say this with any judgment or any criticism, uh, it's just an observation that so much of what's being talked about is calling people to greater self-fulfillment, uh, a self-preservation, uh, greater self-reliance, uh, my dreams, my desires, how God can give me to, how God can get me more of the stuff that I want and so forth. Now, that does not mean that God doesn't care about our stuff. I mean, there's, there's verses about that but the issue of the scripture is the issue of, of, of priority. That really the, 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 the things that God gives us is to those who give themselves fully to the things that he wants. Matthew 6, 33, seek, I love this verse, seek first the kingdom of God and what? All these things will be added. I love that. It says added. You don't, in other words, you don't, have, you don't even have to chase it. <laughs> it will be added to you. When we seek First, the kingdom, our lives become a magnet to things that God wants to add. And, and much anxiety in our lives is when we pursue that which God promised that he would add. And so much of what we're being encouraged into in, in all kinds of different ways is about how we can get more of what God said he would add rather than say, no, let's give ourselves more fully to God's kingdom and his righteousness. Paul is addressing the issue of the consuming aspect of self-interest rather than a life that is uh, consumed with God's vision, God's purpose, God's calling, a life of deep, holy love to our friends, family, and adversaries, and living a life of servanthood. In other words, a, a life that yields uh, dividends um, in eternity. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. He says, now according to the grace of God, which was given to me. In other words, Paul says, I was given the grace, I was given an anointing. I was given a divine enablement to build. He goes, and as a wise master builder, he goes, I begin to lay a foundation and another one builds on that foundation. But then he says this, but take heed that the foundation has been laid, and we'll talk about the foundation in just a second. He says, the foundation has been laid, but we must be very intentional and very careful how it is that we build on the foundation. And that's the thing that gets evaluated. What gets evaluated is how we build on that foundation in terms of our personal life and how we build on that foundation insofar as our impact to those that are around us through the gospel. Verse 11, he says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so we find out that Christ Jesus, the Son of God, he is the foundation that was laid and the foundation that was built. Now, admittedly, to say that Jesus is our foundation, we, we, we know that, most of us know that, and it's, a, and it's our confession, it's something that we believe, but yet at the same time, Jesus being our foundation can seem a little abstract. So kind of like, okay, so what does it really mean in terms of the day-to-day -day outworking of my life? Well, I'm going to take a stab at it. I think it means at least three things. Number one, Jesus being our foundation, it means that we have embraced the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have said yes to the finished work of the cross by faith, and it's brought us into the born-again experience. And because of the born-again experience, God now takes residence inside of us. He lives in our spirit because of the born-again experience. That's the foundation. 
It also includes then knowing and growing. Even though we are born again, we never want to lose sight of the glory, the beauty, the wonderment of the finished work of the cross, in particular as it relates to the revelation of his love. The revelation of the love of God. That we will continue to grow in our understanding of the, the, the enormity, the, the hugeness, the largeness of God's love that was demonstrated when Jesus died on the cross for us. Romans 5, 8, Paul says that God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. All throughout the New Testament, over and over and over again, when when it talks about God's love for us, almost every time, right around the corner, it connects it with the finished work of the cross. God so loved you and me that Jesus The Son of God became a man, and he died for us. I mean, I can't get over that thought, and I hope to never get over that. Jesus loves us. God loves us. God so loved the world. He so loved the world now. I mean, 2,000 years ago, he gave himself for the crazy world as it is right now. He goes, I love the world. Even though by nature... We were children of wrath. God, who is rich in mercy, he gave his son for you and me. And that is so basic and so one-on-one that we're ready to kind of move on to the next thing. And the Lord goes, no. He goes, I have so much more to show you through the word and by my spirit of what I think about you and how I feel about you, that you may know who it is that I am and who it is you are to me. That is part of the foundation. When when our lives are built on a foundation, it means that it's stable. It means that it's secure. It means that it can withstand all manner of pressures. Like it says in the Sermon on the Mount, the house is beaten with rain and winds and storms, and yet the house remains solid. And part of what enables us to stay strong and solid is by continuing to grow in the understanding of the love that God showed us while we were still his enemies. And how that love brought us in and when we said yes to it and how that love was lavished upon us, which brings you to the second point, is not only the saving knowledge, but it's growing in the intimate knowledge. Now we can enter into the relationship and we can begin to experience that love that he has for us the love that he has towards us, the the tenderness that he has towards us, the the thoughts that he has towards us, the feelings that he has towards us, the the delight, the joy, the the, the pleasure, all the things that he is, that he has these thoughts and these commitments towards us. And as we grow in the intimate knowledge of Christ, what happens is Galatians chapter 419 is Christ now begins to get formed in us. So in the born-again experience, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, came and took residence inside of us. But as you and I are beginning to grow in intimate knowledge with him, Christ now begins to get formed in us. Where our internal atmosphere, the way I like to say it, begins to shift And it begins to take on the fragrance of him. And as Christ gets formed in us, then the third thing happens, which I think is part of the foundation, Christ gets expressed through us. Christ gets expressed through us. Now, the way it's expressed all looks different because of our personalities and giftings, but the essence, the the quality of it is consistent with who he is. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, they begin to manifest in our, in our family, friends, the co-workers, and all the, 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 the assignments, the, the very purpose, the, the very agenda of God begins to get manifest in us and through us. The saving knowledge, the intimate knowledge, the, the knowledge of his purpose, I believe that is part of the, the foundation that, that Paul is talking about. 
I mentioned earlier that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, and 3, and 4, they, they kinda, they, they, it's important to kind of put them together. And Paul talks about, in 1 Corinthians 3, 10, he talks at 11, he talks about Jesus being the foundation. And what's interesting is that in the, ver- in the chapter before, chapter 2, verse 2, he, he introduces, so to speak, Jesus in a very specific way. And Paul makes a very definitive statement. He makes a, uh, it, it's, a it's a statement of, of zeal. It, it is a statement of resolve. It is a statement of desire. It is a statement of focus. It is a statement of vision. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, I am determined, Paul says, to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What a statement. He says, all that I am and all that I am about is to thrust myself into that reality, to know him and him crucified. What does that mean? Well, I talked a bit about it earlier that when we're talking about the cross, it's, it's, it's referring to the work of the cross. And knowing and understanding and growing in our understanding and appreciation for what it is that he did on the cross 2,000 years ago. But secondly, the cross is not just talking about the event of the cross. The cross gives us insight into the ways of God and in how he is and how it is that he expects us to walk. Jesus makes it very clear. He says, if any man is to come after me, he is to deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Knowing Christ and him crucified is knowing Christ and his ways and and recognizing that, I don't know about you, but in my life, when I look at the word, everything that the word calls me to has got a four-letter word, C-R-O-S-S, the cross, the cross. Every time the scripture calls me to obey the Lord, it is the cross every single time. So Christ and crucified is the revelation of God, not only in what he has done, but in how he calls us to imitate him. Ephesians 5.1, he says, be imitators of Christ in God. And the way that we imitate Christ, the way that we imitate God is by living the life of the cross. There's a book uh, called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he says that when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. That's the life that we're called to live. It's a life to die so that Christ would live in us and through us that we might live. Live with him through the born again experience, intimacy with him, and him expressing who he is in us and through us. Every time the scripture calls me to restrain myself, to not speak evil of a person that annoys me or a person that really has set themselves out to come against me and make my life difficult or whatever. The scripture tells us to, hey, the Lord says, hey, you know, bl- I want you to bless your enemies. I want you to, to, to pray for them. I want you to bless them. I'm going, I don't want to pray for them and bless them. I mean, I'm happy to not think about them. He goes, no, 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 no. I don't want you, I actually want you to think about them. <laughs> I want you to pray for them. I'm going, oh, really? Lord Jesus, no, I for, for forget them. No, he goes, no, I don't want you to forget them. I'm like, oh, I forget. Lord, really? Ah, how about I just don't think about it? I won't say anything. He goes, no. He goes, I want you to say something about them, and I want you to say it to me. I'm like, hmm. That, that exercise, beloved, that is not a suggestion. The Lord says, he goes, bless those who persecute you. Bless your enemies. Pray for those. Here's one for you. It's so not popular. Pray for those who spitefully use you. And you're like, what? It's yes. I'm like, 
<laughs> How about just, Lord, just give me my paycheck, bless my family. He goes, he goes, I will give you a paycheck. I will bless your family. He goes, but there's more that I'm after in you. I want to form something in you that has the quality and the reflection of my son. And I'm like, oh, man, that evangelist on the street when he told me about Jesus, he didn't tell me that part. You know, he didn't give me the fine print. He goes, well, I'm telling you the fine print now. He goes, I want you to learn my ways. Yeah, I remember some years ago, there was a, uh, some, I was doing a Q&A session with some young adults, and they, one of them asked me this question. They said, why is it, he said, if God is personal, they said, why is it uh, so hard to get to know him and actually have an intimate relationship with him. I said, well, I said, there's several reasons for it, but one of the reasons is is because part of what makes relationships work is shared values. I said, do you understand that we have absolutely nothing in common with them at all? Like, at all. Like, what do you mean? I said, well, it's kind of like this. I I go, imagine, imagine Jesus sends you an email, you know, whatever, just work with me here for a second, he says, hey, I want to meet with you at a coffee shop, and I want to start us to have a relationship to get to know each other. Okay, great. So you go to the coffee shop. You're sitting at the table. you sitting in front of you, and he looks at you. You look at him. It's kind of awkward. You go, and how do I start a conversation with somebody that knows everything? And it's, uh, this is kind of weird. So he goes, you know, I'll start the conversation. He goes, you know, part of friendship is really having shared values. You go, yeah. He goes, don't you just love really going out of your way to make everyone around you look better than you? Isn't that like the greatest thing ever? And like, don't you like love it like when someone comes against you, you're actually up all night thinking of ways of how you can be a blessing to them? Isn't it like, doesn't that make you like feel wonderful? Okay. <laughs> you see where this is going, right? He, he wants to establish his value system in our hearts. It's, it's what he's after, the formation of his ways. And one of the things that actually empowers us to live that way is the revelation of his love as well as the understanding that there is a calling that awaits us in the age to come. A calling to rule and reign with the Son of God. You and I have an assignment with Jesus that he wants us to have with him in the age to come, to rule and reign with him. Paul continues. He talks about, in verses 12 to 14, he talks now about the quality of the work. There is a quality of work. Verse 12, he talks about building on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. And that on that day, when we stand before the Lord, our works actually will be made clear. The the quality of the work that we did will be made clear before the Lord and for all to see on that day. Now, what is gold, silver, and precious stones? He's talking about that which is valuable, durable, and costly. He's talking about a life that yields dividends that is valuable. Not that we are more valuable, but, but, he is, but it's the work that we did in our personal lives and in the way that we relate with one another. He says, that is valuable to me, number one. Number two, it is durable. In other words, it is a work that will be showcased, that will be carried with us into the age to come. And thirdly, it is costly. It's what we talked about earlier, that when we get called to the way of the cross, it, it costs us everything. Then he talks about wood, hay, and straw. It is the works that are of no value in terms of eternity, that are temporal, and they are cheap. It didn't cost us anything insofar as responding to the grace of God. Some years ago, I was doing a wedding, and the, uh, uh, the young man that uh, was getting married to his bride, um, he, is, uh, he, he is in the U.S. Army. 
And, uh, and so he comes, you know, he's, you know, dressed up. He's got the, the formal, you know, he's got the, the medals, the, the, the whole deal and everything. And we're all just kind of standing there together. The groomsmen are there. I'm standing there. He's there. And we're about to go out. And for some reason, there were some technical difficulties. And so it kind of delayed the, the procession a little bit. And so we're just kind of standing there, just kind of having, you know, some small conversations. And I, and, but I was really fascinated by his uniform. And just, I mean, the guy had like medals. I mean, the whole deal. And I, I said, so, I said, man, that's pretty intense. He goes, well, thank you. I said, I said what's, he goes, what's that, that reward? What's that one for? What's that about? And I pointed at one of them, one of the ribbons. And he, he goes, oh, you know, when we were in Afghanistan, you know, this and this happened and da-da-da-da-da, and we did this, and I did this, and they did this, and this would happen, blah, blah, blah. And so I got this reward. I'm like, okay, cool. What about that one? So, and I, I, I must have pointed out like two or three of them. And I noticed that every single one of the ribbons had a story behind it. And then it connected with me. I went, I said, oh, that's the rewards. I said, that is how the reward system will work. Because it's not only that we will rule with him in the age of Corinth, that's glorious, but he will actually give us things. The scripture talks about a crown of righteousness for certain things. It talks about the crown of life for another set of things. It talks about uh, being given white robes for a whole other set of things. Uh, in some cases, we will be given uh, what is being offered to us is, I love this, is a name that only he, you and him will know. I mean, can you imagine that, that you stand there, he goes, he goes, I want to tell you something. And he gives you a name, and literally you and him are the only one who know what that name is. It talks about this bright stone, this gem-like stone that's being given. Now imagine with me for a second, you know, a billion years from now, we're in the resurrection, all this stuff is over, and there are, I don't know, at least a billion, two billion believers, if you look over the, you know, two, three thousand years, and, and now and beyond, I mean, there, there's these, in the resurrection, and, um, and each person has a story, and we get to know each other a little bit, and, you know, we're kind of walking around, and imagine I bump into one of you. Hey, hey, how you doing? You know, what's your name? My name is so-and-so. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from St. Louis. Really? Man, I used to be in St. Louis all the time. He goes, really? He goes, where'd you live? I said, I was living in Kansas City. He goes, oh, that's interesting. Like what, like, what time in history were you living in St. Louis? Because, you know, you got to be very specific, you know, because it could be the 1800s. And uh, guy goes, no, nah, I've been uh, in the 21st century. Really, I was, I was in Missouri in the 21st century. Man, 2020, right? He goes, oh, yeah, 2020. I remember 2020. I said, man, that was intense, wasn't it? He goes, man, I really was. He made the pandemic, and he had the riots, and he had the this, he had the that. And man, those are, those are tough times. He goes, yeah, tell me about it. Man, he goes, man, that's a pretty sweet little, little crown you got there. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. He said, well, what's that all about? Well, remember 2020? He goes, yeah. He goes, I lost my job in 2020. I said, really? I said, yeah. I mean, with all the, when, you know, the, the shutdown of the country and just all the different things. And, man, it just brought pressure on me and my family and my wife, my kids. And, man, some of my old ways were coming back and some of my, my temptations and Addictions. I mean, I was just completely demoralized. I just didn't know which way was up. I wanted to provide for my family. I couldn't. And I just was, I was really just about ready just to give up on the Lord and on my family. And, and, and uh, I don't know, I just, you know, I, just something in me. I just like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cling to the Lord. And, and you know what? I, I overcame. And, you know, 30 years later, you know, I stood before the Lord and, and he goes, Here's a crown for you. And you're like, what's that about? Oh, that's a 2020 crown. He goes, remember this? He goes, well, yeah, it's a rough year. He goes, he goes, I know more about 2020 than you know about 2000. I know more about what you went through than what you knew that you went through. He goes, I understood your struggle way more than your struggle struggle, and I understood what it cost you to not say no to me in 2020. And he like, and I'm, and I'll be like, man. He goes, that is amazing. He goes, he goes, what about that robe? He goes, oh, he goes, well, that robe. Well, how much time you got? He goes, we got all eternity. So let's just keep talking. 
And that's just one person. And each believer will have some measure of a reward and it will all be connected to our response. Let's have the worship team come up. It will all be connected to our response to Jesus in the grace of God. And it will be rewarded. He goes, man, that's a pretty cool function you got. He goes, oh, he goes, man, let me tell you about it. He goes, how'd you get that job? He goes, man. He goes, you know what? He goes, I was over at, you know, 2020 again, you know, just, you just kind of be bopping around, you know, wearing my mask or, I don't know, trying to figure out how to do life and standing in line and this guy, uh, uh, you know, swiped his credit card to pay for his groceries and his credit card got declined. And he goes, honestly, he goes, I didn't have that much, but I figured my credit card started working and his is not and I had some cash in my pocket, so I, I paid for the guy's groceries. He goes, to be honest with you, he goes, I completely forgot about it. He goes, I'm standing there at the judgment seat, and Jesus got all smiley, and he goes, you remember 2020 and this particular Monday at Walmart? He goes, no. He goes, well, I remember. He goes, let me tell you what happened. And he rewards you for that. Beloved, this life that you and I are living is a life to prepare us, to train us, and to equip us to receive a great reward. Things are tough right now, but God's grace is stronger. God's grace lives in us, there to empower us, to equip us, to strengthen us, to refresh us, to give us hope. We have more opportunities to, we are now being given all kinds of opportunities to develop gold in our lives. Father, thank you. Without faith, it is impossible to please you. For whoever comes to you, Lord, must know that you are and that you are the rewarder of those who diligently seek you. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus this morning, Lord, that you would release your strength in us. Refresh us. Strengthen us. Empower us. Lavish and wash and shower your love and your mercies. We want to be wholly yours. Lord, you said, he this and ear, let him hear. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would anoint the reading of your word, the meditation of your word, the communication of your word. We want to see marvelous things. Father, I ask you again, you cause the morning star to rise on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.
morning. Let's give Stuart one more hand. Stuart, thank you for your word this morning. It brings strength to our hearts. If I could get the prayer team, any prayer team members, if you'll go ahead and come forward this morning. Hey, if you're here and you need prayer for anything, maybe a sickness, you need healing in your body, maybe a relationship, maybe just say, even something Stuart was just speaking on and, and it, it's moved your heart in a way that you want to respond to the Lord and have someone just pray with you about it. You know, we're not meant to go through this journey of, of Christianity alone. This isn't a Lone Ranger Christianity. It's meant to be wrestled with and walked through with the family of God together. So I want to encourage you, if you have a pressure in your life, let us pray with you and stand with you. If I just get any prayer team members, go ahead and come down. Also, I want to remind any young adults, single, married, you know, college, young professionals, we're going to be upstairs in the atrium. I'd love for you just to stop by and say hi and yeah, meet some other people, grab a bite to eat if you'd like to. Let me say a prayer over us this morning as we go. Father, keep us safe as we go. We ask you for your blessing in our homes, Lord, upon our health. Lord, we pray that we would, that we would be honorable towards your name this week, that we would please you in all that we do and say, help us, help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, Grace Church. We'll see you soon. Again, if you need prayer for anything, come on down. If I get any leaders, I need a handful of leaders. If you'll just come make yourself available here for about five minutes to be available to pray with anybody, I'd much appreciate it. God bless you. at church today at Grace Church STL. We are so glad that you've joined us today. If you need prayer, text us at 314-310-0314 and our team would love to contact you this week and pray for you. Have a great week.